Tejasvina vadita mastu ma vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 Om May the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace, peace and beneficence be to us and to all beloved beings everywhere. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Tuesday evening class where we're reading and discussing the life of Sri Sharada Devi, the Holy Mother, as presented to us in the book Sri Sharada Devi, Her Divine Play by Swami Chetanananda. Uh, before we go ahead, are there any comments, concerns, or questions left from last week? that should be, uh, should be raised before we go ahead with our reading. By the way, uh, Haima has let me know that they're having very severe weather there in Denver. So it's possible that she could lose power or simply lose internet service, uh, depending on what happens. Uh, so far, everything is all right. She's she's okay, and uh, the connection is clearly stable. So, if there isn't anything from anyone, she can go ahead and begin her reading. All right, hi, my dear. Please go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Namaste. We are on page six eighty three, and Brother Shankara, I'll start on one paragraph before. It's a very profound paragraph. Last week, I read it, but, you know, I don't think we got it a lot more into it. It is said that only a good student can be a good teacher. And a good teacher learns continuously, so his or her teachings remain always fresh. Ramakrishna said, as long as I live, so long do I learn. Sarajubala recorded how Holy Mother learned various things in her village. Regarding creation, one night the mother said, in the beginning of creation, the creator made human beings with the quality of sattva. As a result, they were born with divine knowledge. In no time, they understood that the world was not real. So they immediately renounced the world and followed the path of God realization. They practiced severe austerities, attained liberation, and merged into the divine. The creator then found that the purpose of his creation had not been realized. Those wise ones were unfit to continue the play in the world. <laughs> So the creator added rajas and tamas to sattva and created human beings with those three qualities. Thus, his play in the world continued nicely. Then she cited a beautiful rhyme regarding creation. She continued, my daughter, in our youth, we learned so many wonderful things from seeing the yatras, dramas, and listening to the narrators of mythological stories. 
nowadays we seldom hear those things before we go ahead yes. what is the lesson of mother's story about these two instances of creation let us be like those first people the the, the beings the the jivas that were created in the first creation let us see that the world is not our true home that it is the home of uh, sattva rajas and tamas and that our true nature is sattvic now in this time we do not have to the master sri ramakrishna and mother have said we don't have to practice those severe austerities all we have to do is with great sincerity call on the name of the lord as sri chaitanya put it not that many hundred years ago and uh, sri ramakrishna endorsed this very strongly the whole uh, incarnation of chaitanya here is chaitanya's prayer the way it opens chant the name of the lord and his glory unceasingly that the mirror of the heart may be wiped clean and quench that mighty forest fire worldly lust raging furiously within if the mirror of the heart is wiped clean its reflection of the truth and our true original nature is perfect and glorious if the mighty forest fire of worldly lust is quenched we no longer have the desire for those things of tamas and sattva i mean tamas and rajas we no longer have the desire for those things materialism and vanity so that's the lesson of mother's story and the glory is that now, uh, unlike the time that Brahma created the universe, uh, there is this great dispensation that we have only to call on the Lord and his or her name with, with great sincerity, and that is enough. Any comments or questions from anyone? <clears throat> this is the this is the point of mother telling that story. Well, it's not over. This is Jeff. Yes, Jeff. Um, I'm a little bit puzzled over the fact that uh, in the first creation, human beings had the quality of sattva and nothing else, and so they they achieved divine union, they achieved uh, the purpose of life. And so what was the problem here? Well, there was there was no problem uh, as far as they were concerned. The problem was Brahma's. Brahma's task was to create a universe and, and uh, make real that uh, statement from uh, the Chandogya Upanishad, this this desire of the cosmic mind which is impenetrable to us why that desire could arise it is a causeless cause but the it's interpreted in the chandogya upanishad as i am one i shall become many and so it becomes brahma's task the creator the 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 aspect of of divinity that is responsible for creation to make that a at least an apparent reality uh, so he is the magician he and mother are the magicians that bring this universe into being and so he discovered <clears throat> that he needed to add when in another instance of mother telling this story, she called the, the Tamas and Rajas materialism and vanity. 
she, she called the three gunas goodness, sattva, materialism, tamas, and vanity, rajas. She didn't call them by their, their Sanskrit names. She called them by, she spoke of them in this way. So, and, and, and in that story, she said, Brahma did this, and then in her words, the game could go on with a swing. And it is going on with a swing. Here we are. So that's why I related the understanding that the moral of mother's story, so to speak, is that if we take the attitude of the first beings, then as, as Vivekananda says, our universe will disappear. Not the universe of Brahma's creation of the three gunas, but our universe will disappear because there will be no more vibration within the mind stuff. No vrittis, vibrations, disturbances. The word vritti actually means whirlpool. What does a whirlpool do? Draw, draw you downward. No more whirlpools in the mind stuff. The mind stuff is not in your head. It is in every cell of your body. And so when we have desires reflective of our materialism and vanity, they are echoed in every cell of our body as these disturbances or vrittis that pull us downward, pull us into uh, the, uh, the apparent reality of time, space, and causation. <clears throat> the game, as it's called in uh, Mother's second telling of the story. So, does that, does that explain it, Jeff? Um, uh, I, I guess it does. <laughs> well, wh where is it? Let's, let's not let it, leave it there. If there's still some concern or doubt or question, Let's explore it. What is it? Well, from Brahma's point of view, he was trying to create uh, a universe that would perpetuate, uh, and, but it didn't have duality. So um, that led to the second creation, right? That's the way Mother tells the story, yes. Okay, that, that part I can understand. I was also looking at the preceding paragraph about a good student um, becoming a good teacher. And I'm wondering if the uh, human beings in the first creation had it too easy in attaining enlightenment and didn't uh, learn all the lessons that they should have. And no, 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 no. There's only one lesson to learn. And, and it's, it said they practiced severe austerities that is to say they rejected all the desires that arise from sattva sattva is also a robber sattva also gives rise to vrittis we can have very lofty desires for certain kinds of achievement certain kinds of name and fame. Vivekananda himself dealt with this attachment and his, his, his attachment to other human beings. It was a very lofty attachment. It was not a base attachment, very lofty attachment. If you read the story of his life, you will see that he struggled with attachment and with mm, the, the one time he was overheard walking on the grounds of Bellarmat. This was in the months before he passed away. He was overheard muttering to himself, fame is filth, fame is filth, fame is filth. <clears throat> the fame that would have been sought by a Vivekananda 
would have been the kind of fame that uh, is, is very lofty indeed. It wouldn't have been a base kind of fame, but even that fame. So he was, he, he was practicing the austerities of discriminating against any kind of attachment, even the most lofty kinds and any kinds of uh, desire for name and fame, even the most lofty kinds. So sattva is also a robber. Sattva can also be a robber. Sattva, there was a kind of time, space, and causation. Beyond our understanding, of course, we have no idea what it's like to be without materialism and vanity. But there was a kind of time, space, and causation in that first universe. Otherwise, there would have been no linearity <clears throat> to, their, uh, to their learning, to their severe austerities. There would have been no need for that at all. So that's, sattva is also, the, the three gunas are called the three robbers. Sattva is a very lofty kind of robber. It is the revealing power after all, but uh, it is still capable of generating vrittis in the citta, whirlpools in the mind stuff, which keep us just that bound. So thanks for clarifying this, Jeff. Thanks for asking it to be clarified. I hope that does clarify it. Uh, if there is still any concern, question, or comment from your own wisdom or experience, please, please share it. No, that, uh, that helps, brother. Thank you. Okay. Uh, brother Shankara? Yes, dear. Um, such a lovely story and something to keep in mind. Uh, because recognition for worldly attachments um, is inevitable, I guess. That, I mean, that's the way society functions, from small recognitions to the kind of large recognition, depending on uh, each one's, I guess, um, station. Mm -hmm. So it's so important. I mean, even in like a, a small group, somebody uh, is recognized, whether by an award or words or... So uh, it's important not to get attached to that and, um, um, you know, do this discrimination. And uh, my son was telling me, I haven't watched it, but apparently there is a monologue by Jerry Seinfeld on awards um, that sounded very interesting. This just brought to my memory. So maybe I'll look it up. Well, it sound, uh, Jerry Seinfeld is one very intelligent fellow. So if he has something to say, about awards, I'm sure it is uh, worth our attention. Uh, Seinfeld is, uh, he, he's, he's not just an actor. He is really quite a, a lovely little thinker, as, <laughs> as it's said in a song. Uh, he is a, a TM practitioner. Is he indeed? Yes. Well, I'm not surprised at that. Um, many, of, many in Hollywood are. The Maharishi made quite a splash in the entertainment world. It wasn't just the Beatles. Brother Shankara, uh, about the Sattva, Raja, and Tamagunas, chapter 18 of Bhagavad Gita explains so well. Uh, yes, he yes. Says it it, you do not need to do austerities or rituals, just have faith in me and be devoted and go into silence, do the meditation. And that's what he, he explains very broadly in that chapter 18. Yes. And in, uh, that is, that you, may clear Jeff's doubts on. If you read Papa. chapters 17 and 18 together, yeah. uh, it, you really get very great clarity exactly. about what it is that's going on here and who's responsible for what. And so thank you, Haima. You're absolutely right. Chapter 18, and there's a reason it is the, the ultimate chapter of the Gita. There's a reason 
that uh, 18 adds to 9, and so on. And uh, summarizes everything, the whole 17 chapters. I think the 18, he create, he summarizes at the end, telling Arjuna, now you decide. This is what I'm giving you. Now you decide what you want to do. And Arjuna does say, my doubts are re re resolved. Yes, he my does. Doubt, my doubts are gone. I yes. place myself entirely at your feet. Thank so thank you, Haima. You're absolutely right. Chapter 18. But I'll add to that for anyone who's reading. I mean, the Gita is only 700 verses long, for goodness sakes. Uh, you know, the, the scholarly treatises that you can buy, you know, that you, they make the Gita, you know, two inches thick. But it doesn't need to be that way. Just get Swami Prabhavananda's uh, translation and commentary. And it's a half inch thick. And there's virtually no commentary except some appendices at the back and some occasional footnotes. And uh, uh, then you can just get at least Swami Prabhavananda's very well-informed uh, interpretation of what it is that Krishna actually said, put into lovely English by Christopher Isherwood. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it about the Gita. <clears throat> Prabhavanandas is the one for people here in the West, both the Indians who have uh, now have made this their home and, uh, and, and need to have just this intensely uh, clear uh, English translation of the Gita uh, rather than try to read it themselves in Sanskrit. Uh, and then certainly for us Westerners, us born here, who have come to this path. And as Haima said, uh, the Gita is, is uh, so instructive. But I remind everyone that we're uh, reading here about Holy Mother, who is none other than Sri Ramakrishna. They were one being in two forms. And Sri Ramakrishna said over and over, you have only to call on the name of the Lord, even once with sincerity, true sincerity, full heartedness, whole heartedness, shedding a tear. And that, and that alone will be enough. Brother, this is Jeff again. Yes, Jeff. Uh, I believe I heard you say um, uh, fairly recently that um, uh, you might be leading a class in the Gita. Yes. <clears throat> one of the other ones includes, right? As soon as we're finished <coughs> with divine grace. Excuse me, I tried to talk and drink at the same time. <coughs> yes. I'm, I'm, sorry, as... I'm, I'm sorry I contributed to that. No, no, you did, well, no, why don't take any responsibility, Jeff? It wasn't your doing. My ignorance, uh, pers persistent ignorance about drinking and talking at the same time is lifelong. So uh, my follow-up question is, when that uh, class starts, will it be uh, Swami Prabhupada's uh, work? <coughs> yes, ab absolutely. Okay, thank you. And that will be sometime probably in the fall of this year. Uh, we'll, we'll take that up because we're moving right along in divine grace. And... Uh, I'm actually kind of surprised at how fast we're moving, but uh, <clears throat> it's because the congregation is such such good students. Mm -hmm. We're moving right along. So anything else before Haima reads on? Okay, dears, and thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Swayam. Uh, this was very productive, I believe. So, move on, move on, Brother Shankara. Please do, dear. Okay. Sometimes, Holy Mother tested the faith of her disciples. 
Saraju Bala recorded. One day I went to Bag Bazaar and found Holy Mother resting after her lunch. She was gracious enough to ask me to fan her. Suddenly I heard her speaking to herself. Well, you all have come here, but where is the master? I said in reply, we could not meet him in this life. Who knows in which future birth we shall be able to see him. But this is our greatest good fortune that we've been able to touch your feet. Mm -hmm. That is true indeed, was the brief remark of the mother. I was rather amazed by this avowal. Very seldom did she speak of herself in such a way. Now, in jail let's, let's let's just be clear what she said. She said, where is the master? To this very close disciple, someone that she asked to fan her. She didn't ask everyone to do these personal services for her. This is significant. Uh, I bring this up because a lot of Westerners don't understand that uh, the, these personal services were something that were that was asked only of the close and near and dear disciples. And so this is why Surabala brings up the fact that mother asked her to fan her. And so then the mother asks this question, well, you all come here, but where is the master? And Surabala's answer is just perfect. You know, we didn't get the grace of the master's darshan in this lifetime, who knows when we will, but we have come to your holy feet. And the mother says, true indeed. So now what does, uh, what does uh, Surabala say uh, in reply? I was rather amazed by this avowal. Seldom. Very seldom. Very seldom did she speak of herself in this way. In other words, that she and the master were one and that to see her was as good as seeing the master. So, and, and, and you know, so it's just as we're studying her life, we are studying the life of that one being in this aspect. So we done, dear. Okay. In Jairambati, Holy Mother had a hard time finding flowers for worship. The villagers grew vegetables around their houses rather than flowering plants. <clears throat> Swami Gaurishwarananda wrote in his reminiscences, I had a passion for gardening right away, right from my childhood. In Jairambati, sometimes the mother did not have any flowers to worship with. She would offer only tulsi leaves, durga grass, bell leaves, and sandalwood paste to the master. At the same time. Doesn't it say durva, durva grass? Dur, oh, durva grass. Yes, durva grass. D U R V A. Yeah. I'll read again. She would offer only tulsi leaves, durva grass, bell leaves and sandalwood paste to the master, addressing him, master, not a single flower could be procured today. Be pleased to accept these. I had planted some flowering trees, jasmine, red ole oleander, marigold, hibiscus, dopati, tagar, and sour leathers. How delighted the mother was with those flowers. <laughs> One day I discovered the mother digging at the roots of the jasmine plant after her noon rest. I snatched the spade from her hand saying, I shall attend to this. You don't have to do it. She said, you do everything for the plant because I'm very fond of jasmine. And now that is the that it is the season for these flowers to bloom. I was digging the soil so that it can be watered well. Mm. 
In other words, she was loosening. Loosening, but the, the the soil of Jairambati is quite clay. Uh, that that uh, it's uh, river silt, um, basically, uh, and uh, you know from the from the floods, you know, great amounts of silt are deposited, and that turns into a kind of clay. So that's why the mother was loosening the dirt around the plant, so that it would be able to receive enough water when when it was watered or when rain fell. That's what she was doing. For those of you who don't know gardening, uh, I know gardening because of my sister is such an expert gardener. And she does that around here as well because the, the soil of, of <clears throat> this part of Georgia is also quite clay. So anyway, that's what she was doing. That's why she did that. So you want to hear a little incident again, dear? Sure. I had planted some flowering trees, jasmine, red oleander, marigold, hibiscus, dopati, tiger, and several others. How delighted the mother was with those flowers. <laughs> One day I discovered the mother digging at the roots of the jasmine plant after her noon rest. I snatched the spade from her hands, saying, I shall attend to this. You don't have to do it. <clears throat> she said, you do everything for the plant because I'm very fond of jasmine. And now that it is the season for these flowers to bloom, I was digging the soil so that it can be watered well. Mm. When the first oleanders blossomed, she did not let anyone pick the flowers, even for worship. She would say, let Rame come and see how beautifully his shrub has blossomed. Now, he, you know, this was the Swami. This was his birth name. She never called those Swamis by their sannyas names. She always called them by their, um, by their birth names. That's who she's referring to. <clears throat> so please let, let Rame read that let again. Let Rame come. She would say, let Rame come and see how beautifully his shrub has blossomed. He himself will pluck the flowers. Only then shall I offer them to the master. Mm. Such boundless love. <laughs> you see, mother was perfectly selfless. Though she wanted flowers for the worship, she wouldn't pick these until the Swami had seen the, the flowers of his, the plant he had taken care of from its babyhood. <clears throat> so wonderful. Such boundless love, yes. On Saturday, as soon as I came and greeted the mother, she led me by the hand to the shrub and exclaimed, look, such beautiful flowers your shrub has borne such sweet fragrance too. She handed me a basket. I gathered the flowers and brought them to her. Only then did she worship the master with them. One day I took to her a lime plant that I had grown by grafting. Ah. There were seven or eight limes on it. The mother was delighted and kept saying to everyone, just see how clever the boy is. He has grown the graft so well that is already bearing fruit. <laughs> Another day, I had broken off a large branch of an amlaki tree with fruit on it and given it to the mother. She was displeased and forbade me to break off branches of fruit bearing trees with fruit on them, in particular, amlaki trees. This Amlaki tree stood on the bank of the Amodar River. Revered Sharat Maharaj, Yoginma, and Gopalma Golap. used to, Golapma, I'm sorry. Revered Sharat Maharaj, Yoginma, and Golapma used to meditate under it. Sharat Maharaj used to chant the Gita too. 33 crores of gods and goddesses dwell under an amlaki tree, the mother said. Now, see what she's 
saying why not to break off the branch. She's, she gives, she gives up, she doesn't just say don't do it. She gives this really eloquent story. Now, how much, how many for us Westerners, how many is 33 crores? Is, is, is this not many millions? Yes. Uh, 33 crores, each, each isn't a crore 100,000? So 3,300,000, 3, somebody translate that into millions. 3.3 .3 million, something like that. Some mathematical person. That's a, that's a lot of gods and goddesses. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's about 330 million, actually. 330 million? Is that, that's, the, that's all, the, that's all the, the, the gods and goddesses that there are in India. And underneath the tree. Yeah. Well, I think no, they're all dwelling, they're all dwelling under to, that tree. <laughs> so, Brother Shankar, I was talking to Vandana, and actually she brought this up. She was uh, reading somewhere, and some uh, expert on Hinduism from India, he said, they are actually only 33. And, uh, and I don't know, I mean, but my, my understanding is that these are, uh, these are beings, uh, spiritual beings. Um, <coughs> I, I don't know, I mean, it's uh, 33, 330 million. There must be some reason why it is so. so <coughs> oh, well, we come across it must be people. indeed. Yeah, I mean, it may be like uh, those, uh, uh, like you know, I was reading, um, I was reading Gospel of Mother the other day, and uh, uh, Mother said that uh, you know she was talking about Ishwara Koti, and so so this one of these disciples she asked her that uh, who are these gods, and, and so she what she said is that uh, Holy Mother said this is that uh, these beings they actually when they are born they are in a very high state and they stay there for millions of years in meditation, thousands of millions of years in meditation. And uh, they only come very off, very, very rarely down and uh, take the form and do some work and they go back. So, uh, you know, these are, these are spiritual beings. It's just uh, in, in, in probably um, some kind of a higher state and only contribute once in a while to the whole universe. One of these, one of these is Vivekananda. Yeah, exactly. And she said that Swamiji was from the highest plane. And yeah, you're right. Yes. So we're we're dealing with uh, we're dealing with these very high beings that are not the prisoner of time, space, and causation. Uh, as it was said of Vivekananda, he dwelt on the very border of the relative and the absolute so that he could see both at the same time. Now, of course, that's incomprehensible to us because we have no idea what the absolute is. We have, we know the word, we know, we have gestures toward it, but uh, these beings, they know it. <coughs> and that's what why Sri Ramakrishna always said about Narendra before he was Swami Vivekananda, while the master was still alive, he said, don't anyone tell Narendra who he is, because if he comes to know, he'll leave. The thing is that he did come to know in uh, June of 1895, and because he felt so strongly what his mission to the West was, he stayed for another seven years. He could have left at that time. The master said, you will not have this realization of Nirvikalpa Samadhi again until your task is finished. And so he did that. that that realization of, of Nirvikalpa Samadhi came to Vivekananda in June of 1895. And yet, though he could have just not returned to his body then and there, he returned to his body 
And if you want to know the immediate result, read the book Inspired Talks, which is transcriptions of this just, it was like somebody had taken the cap off an artesian spring. Uh, this, it just gushed forth from him for days and days and days. It was so intense that his hostess there, Mrs. Dutcher, whose house they were staying in, she couldn't bear it. She, she literally couldn't bear it. She said, Swamiji, I can't take this. I'm going to have to go back to New York. You all stay. You all go ahead with this. But I can't take it. It was just too much for her nervous system. This is this all you can find out in that, in the introduction to that book, uh, Inspired Talks. Any comments or questions before we read on? All right, dear, please read on. She added, Japa and meditation practiced under the Amlaki tree yield greater results. Later, she directed me to save the leaves on that branch for the purpose of worship, <clears throat> remarking, these leaves are also used for worship like bell leaves. That's the end of that particular side. Yes. Uh, heading, Brother Shankar. Yes. And now we're moving on to the next side heading, the last story of a Nepali nun. Yes. Any, any before we go on, uh, what we've read, any uh, comments from your own wisdom or experience about any of this, or any concern that it raises, any any question that you might like to ask, anything you'd like to share with those of us who are are here. All right, dear. The last story of a Nepali nun. Okay. Ashwamitra wrote a fascinating story concerning the Nepali nun who met the mother in Varanasi and who suggested that Holy Mother practice the Panchatapa, see chapter 10, to assuage the grief that she felt after Ramakrishna's passing. With permission from Holy Mother, one of our attendants, whom we can assume was Ashu himself went on pilgrimage to Badarika Ashram, Ashrama in the Himalayas. <clears throat> Ashu went with another monk who was the mother's disciple, but not a member of the Ramakrishna order. They first went to Rishikesh and stayed at Kailash Mount. One early morning, he heard a woman crying pitifully from a nearby cottage. Out of curiosity, he entered the cottage and found a dying woman there. She kept calling out, Mother, you have not yet sent your disciple. As soon as she saw Ashu standing at the door, she said, Finally, you have come. Please come close and sit down. Do what I say. There's not much time left. Ashu was dumbfounded. <clears throat> She said, don't doubt me. You can verify this with Holy Mother. She promised that she would send one of her disciples to me during my last moments. Now do what I say. Under my pillow are 40 rupees and a notebook. When I die, immerse my body in the Ganges with the help of other monks. On the fourth day, use that money to arrange a feast for the monks. Memorize the contents of the notebook within three days and then immerse it in the Ganges. Use the mantras in that notebook for the good of others and never for your own benefit. Hmm. Bah. Ashu ran back to Kailish Mat to find his companion. He left a message for him saying that he would not be able to go to Badarika Ashrama and that he should go on by himself. When he returned to the cottage a few minutes later, 
as she saw that the woman's last moment had arrived. She passed away saying, oh mother, oh mother. He immersed her body in the Ganges with the help of some monks from the Kailash Mat. He then went to Kali Kalmi Baba's ashrama and gave 40 rupees to the abbot there to arrange a feast. <clears throat> he stayed in the ashrama, memorized the mantras in that notebook, and then dropped it in the Ganges after three days. He then wrote a letter to Holy Mother asking for her permission to visit Jairambati, but did not get a reply within six days. So he went to Jairambati and reported the whole story to her. After hearing the tale, the mother said, yes, she made me promise that I would send one of my disciples to her at her last moment. This girl was very good. She knew various kinds of rituals. While I was in Varanasi, she used to visit me and she suggested that I perform the Panchatapa. That's the end of that particular subheading, Nepali Snan story. No. These kinds of stories, of course, It's hard for us to grasp their import because our minds don't want to believe the truth of what's here. So I'm going to ask Haima to read it again sure, Brother Shankar. from the very beginning. Okay. And hold on just a minute. Sure. And, and do your best, as Vivekananda said, in his prologue and introduction, his preface and introduction to Raja Yoga. He said, be like a good scientist. A good scientist, when confronted with something that raises doubt, doesn't say, this isn't so. They say, I simply don't have enough information to judge one way or another whether it's so. So the Swami said, suspend your disbelief. You don't have to believe, but simply don't disbelieve. Ask your mind not to disbelieve. So Haima, would you read it? I mean, this is so instructive to us about our relationship with the mother. That's why I'm asking it to be read again. Definitely, I will <clears throat> before, before we do, any comment or question from anyone? Yes, brother, this is Jeff. I have a yes. question. Yes. Uh, what is pancha tapa? Uh, it's, it's, it's a tapa, tapas is, is an austerity it's sitting in the middle of five fires. Yes. The four fires are lit close enough to you to, to damn near cook you. The fifth fire is the sun itself. So it's, it's five austerities uh, sitting. And, and Mother, it said, after she did this panchatapa, her skin had turned very brown. Uh, in other words, she was slightly burned. First, of course, she would have become sunburned. Then she would have, uh, the melatonin in her, is it melanin, melanin in her skin would have, uh, would have uh, begun to color her skin a dark brown. So panchatapa is this austerity of sitting forgotten how many days it isn't just one day maybe three days does anyone remember how many days it's described in the book it's referred to where you can find it uh, Jeff so you can go back and read about it this the Swami gives a, an indication of what chapter it's in 
it's yes, I, 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 I see a, a footnote uh, right after Pantaka. So I, I yeah. I'll check that out. Thank you. You bet. Anything else from anyone? All right, please read it again. Okay, dear. sure. The last story of a Nepali nun. Ashamitra wrote a fascinating story concerning the Nepali nun who met the mother in Varanasi and who suggested that Holy Mother practice the Panchatapa to assuage the grief that she felt after Ramakrishna's passing. With permission from Holy Mother, one of her attendants, whom we can assume was Ashu himself, went on pilgrimage to Badrika Ashrama in the Himalayas. Ashu went with another monk who was the mother's disciple, but not a member of the Ramakrishna order. They first went to Rishikesh and stayed at Kailash Mat. One early morning, he heard a woman crying pitifully from a nearby cottage. Out of curiosity, he entered the cottage and found a dying woman there. <clears throat> she kept calling out, Mother, you have not yet sent your disciple. As soon as she saw Ashu standing at the door, she said, finally, you have come. Please come close and sit down. Do what I say, there's not much time left. Ashu was dumbfounded. She said, don't doubt me. You can verify this with Holy Mother. She promised that she would send one of her disciples to me during my last moments. Now do what I say. Under my pillow are 40 rupees and a notebook. When I die, immerse my body in the Ganges with the help of other monks. On the fourth day, use that money to arrange a feast for the monks. Memorize the contents of the notebook within three days and then immerse it, in, immerse it in the Ganges. Use the mantras in that notebook for the good of others and never for your own benefit. Ashu ran back to Kailash Mat to find his companion. He left a message for him saying, that he would not be able to go to Badrika Ashrama and that he should go on by himself. When he returned to the cottage a few minutes later, Ashu saw that the woman's last moment had arrived. She passed away saying, oh mother, oh mother. He immersed her body in the Ganges with the help of some monks from the Kailash Mat. He then went to Kali Kalmi, Baba's ashrama, and gave 40 rupees to the abbot there to arrange a feast. He stayed in the ashrama, memorized the mantras in that notebook, and then dropped it in the Ganges after three days. He then wrote a letter to Holy Mother asking for her permission to visit Jairambati, but did not get a reply within six days. So he went to Jairampati and reported the whole story to her. After hearing the tale, the mother said, yes, she made me promise that I would send one of my disciples to her at her last moment. This girl was very good. She knew various kinds of rituals. While I was in Varanasi, she used to visit me and she suggested that I perform the Panchatapa. That's the end. Any comments or questions from anyone? Um, Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. Um, it is um, overwhelmingly uh, joyous. Um, story. That's my comment. Yes, I agree with you entirely, dear. That's why I asked that it be read again with people doing their best to suspend their disbelief yes. that such a thing could happen. 
because I think we can believe mm -hmm. that it happened exactly as related here. Otherwise, Swami Chetanananda would not have included it in this book. What do we make of it? The mother's unending concern for anyone who calls on her. For anyone who calls on her. We can ask for her promise. We can ask for her promise. She is not gone anywhere, as Vivekananda said. If these beings are omnipresent, where would they go? There is only one existence, not two. They are here within this existence. And they are accessible to us if we bring our hearts to that and ask our minds to set aside the tendency to doubt and concern that we're doing something that's meaningless or crazy or whatever it is that our left minds will invent as a reason for us not doing it. <clears throat> if we let our hearts rest on the truths that are that are brought forward by this book. Mother is there for us. And there are those among the congregation who've had very profound experiences of the mother. Some of them very lighthearted and surprising, others of them very moving and the mother being answering, being what she said she would be when she said, when you are in distress, remember you have a mother. So any thing at all from anyone else anything you'd like to share or ask um, brother shankara yes dear at the risk of sounding sentimental which i am due to some recent losses i pray sincerely in the presence of you and fellow devotees and of course uh, mother and um, you know sri ram krishna that when my end comes something similar um, will happen well it is the promise it is the promise you have been given the treasure box of the master and the mother's attainments and just rely on that dear just rely on <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Swayam. And, and it isn't at all sentimental. What is sentimentality? Sentimentality is pretending something's true when it's not. So that it makes ourselves and perhaps others feel good. It's, it's not wrong, it's just ignorant. Sentimentality is a kind of pretense. It's a mild form of hypocrisy. And what you just said and did was not at all sentimental. It was you telling the truth and, uh, and of your yearning as you experience it. So it's not sentimental at all. Anything else from anyone? Brother Shankar, I just want to remind, I remind all of us that we're going to meet next class would be September 6th because we're off on in August. So our Tuesday will be first Tuesday will be September 6th. 
Thank you for mentioning the date. Yes. I was going to mention at the end here that we will, yes. this is our last class until September. And Haima has now reminded us what that date will be, September 6th. So <clears throat> very well, very well, September 6th it is. And we'll take up this Holy Mother's Teachings subhead at that time. Any final thought or comment or question to share from any of you? Thank you so much, Haima, for your reading and for your attentiveness to all of this. Thank you. My honor, Brother Shankar. It's, it's, yes. It, um, it, it, it's, and, and it is, it's a great honor to read her book. It, it isn't, isn't it an honor and a privilege? Yes, it's special. Special privilege. So anything else, dears? All right. Only Brother Shankar. Yes. It is Triguna. Yes, Triguna. <clears throat> My only desire is to, not to come back. I want to be with Thakur and Ma. And I do get emotional when I sit in front of them and I cry. Well, that's what the master says to do. He said, he said, one sincere tear is your guarantee that their promises will be kept. I, I do know that they are in my heart, yet I feel I'm not with them. That's why. Well, dear, as long as we're embodied, hmm? as long as we're within time, space, and causation, there is the appearance of duality. Try not to worry about it too much. Just pour out your heart to them. <clears throat> you have a great guru in Swami Bhashanandaji. You have uh, what is Bhashananda? Bhashananda is a disciple of a direct disciple. Swami Virjananda. Virjananda. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, there, there you have it, dear. So there's the, 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 the lineage is just one, two, three, four. The master, direct disciple, Swami Bhashananda yourself. These here. Takurma are your great grandparents. So don't have any doubts if you can manage not to, dear. Just be, uh, just go ahead and cry your sweet, sincere tears, pour your hearts out to them, and say, when it's time, Come and take me by the hand and lead me wherever you will. Thank you, Triguna, for sharing that with us. Another thing, I think all this we are discussing and listening, analyzing it. What I feel is that this is all knowledge to understand. Only thing I feel that I have to just do chapa and prayer, I worship. Yes. Am I wrong in that? No, dear. <laughs> only, <laughs> because all only, this is no, only, knowledge. Well, that but that's, that's so that we can be together and share it, dear. Yes. That's so we can <laughs> hold hold one another's hands. Right. Now, it's, Holy it's, it, it, but your, your depth, Holy Mother would see you very much. Yeah. Triguna, yes. In the same way that she saw that Nepali nun. She would say, Triguna is a good girl. Hmm? She would say that. 
I can guarantee you that's what she would say. And she would look on you in that same way and be with you in that same way. So you have, don't worry about, I mean, our minds naturally worry. They cast up doubts. It's completely natural. We just have to say, thank you for sharing, but I know something else at a deeper level. <clears throat> and so whatever vibrations are left in your mind, Steph, dear, just try to purify them the best you can by your practices. Japa, contemplation, meditation. Just purify them as best you can. Thank you, Triuna. What a sweet way for us to close. Thank you. Anything else from anyone? All right. Oh, dearly beloved mother, a flower at your feet for each one who comes to your open door, a flower at your feet for each one who stands by your open door and says, come to me, come to me, offering to break this world's chain that binds us down to ignorance, suffering, and death. A flower at your holy feet for each one who takes the path that you have struck through this, your jungle world. Om, Amen. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace. Peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai Durga Durga Durga. May we be safe, may we be healthy, may we be cheerful, may we have peace of mind, may we go forward in the mother's loving and protective embrace. Just to remind you, there will be two more classes and a talk before we the August break. Tomorrow night we study Swami Ranganathananda's Divine Grace. On Saturday, we study uh, Swami Prabhavananda's translation and commentary of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, published under the title, How to Know God. And then, so that we can all be together and share uh, our understanding of Karma Yoga, on this coming Sunday, there will be an open forum on Karma Yoga. And with this week's newsletter, there will be an attachment, a PDF attachment that you can download that is a worksheet uh, for that particular activity. And at, so at 11 a.m. on Sunday, by Zoom, we will have <clears throat> a uh, an open forum on Karma Yoga so that as our last thing before the break, we share with one another <clears throat> our understanding of the path of action, which as Sri Krishna uh, recommends so highly. And if you remember when Swami Vivekananda says, each soul is potentially divine the goal of human life is to manifest this divinity. Do this by, and the first thing he mentions is work. Do this by work or worship or psychic control or philosophy, one or more or all of these, and be free. The first one he mentions is karma yoga, work. So that's what we'll be discussing as a group 
and sharing with one another this Sunday. So please do make an effort to be with us and share so that you have this uh, ability to offer what you are and what you know uh, to the rest of your congregation members. Remember, we are one beneath the appearance. We are one. And so when we share with one another, this is that current of reassurance that uh, is so sweet, so sweet. Any final thought from anyone else? All right, dears. Until then, tomorrow night, if you choose to join us, uh, I'll, I'll sign off. And... <clears throat> May you be well and in bright spirits, dear. Good night.